Hi and welcome to comparethepot.com for all your post-medieval pottery needs. My name is Richard, I'm an archaeology graduate and a London mudlark, which means I search the Thames foreshore at low tide, trying to find um, bits of old pottery and other artefacts. I'm putting together a series of short videos on how to identify pottery. This will be most relevant to Thames finds from London, but hopefully interesting to anyone with a love of old pottery. Today we're going to be looking at one of my favourites, Delftware, and I always enjoy finding pieces of Delftware when I go mudlarking. We're going to look at when it was made, how it was made, and how also to distinguish broken pieces or shards from other pieces of pottery. Delftware is some of the most attractive pottery of the post-medieval period. Uh, when it was first introduced into this country, it wasn't known as Delftware, but Galleyware or Galleypotware, because it was imported in Venetian galleys. Um, Delftware is tin-glazed earthenware, and it has gone under many names. Um, Myolica, Fiance, um, tin-glazed, obviously. These days it's most commonly called Delftware, so that's what I'm going to call it for the purposes of this video. It was first produced in the early medieval period in the Middle East. Um, from there, production spread to Italy. By the 13th century, it was being produced in Italy, and also soon afterwards in Spain. The first Delftware production in the UK uh, began in Norwich in the 1560s, and by the end of the 16th century, production had spread to London, where there were many Delftware factories during its period of popularity. Delftware was most popular from about 1650 to 1770, when the introduction of more durable creamwares uh, killed it off, although simple medicine pots were made right up to the 1840s in London. The great selling point of Delft was its white glaze, which could be attractively decorated Especially popular were styles imitating the expensive Chinese porcelain that was being introduced into Europe in the 17th century, but with a much cheaper price tag. The downside of Delftware is that it's easily chipped, uh, and when found today it rarely survives in good condition. The decoration had to be applied quickly when the glaze was wet, which gives it a great charm and that, plus the beautifully coloured and decorated items produced in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, has always given English Delft a secure place in ceramic history. Museum collections and high prices at auctions. Um, let's just have a quick look at some of these London Delftware pieces which were sold at Christie's recently, and we'll just see how much money people are willing to pay for good quality Delftware. Nice to find one of those in the Thames. But if you can't afford several thousand pounds for a platter, you can easily find some representative pieces in the Thames for free. But how can you recognise Delftware shirts from, say, porcelain or later blue and white pottery? OK, here are some representative shirts from the Thames. These ones are Delftware from the 17th and early 18th centuries. Uh, the middle row is porcelain. And on the, oops, on the other side here are Victorian or late Georgian transfer printed and blue and white earthenwares. OK, so how we, do we distinguish when we find sherds in the Thames or anywhere else for that matter? Uh, which ones are which? Well, the body of the clay, uh, the tin glazed, is obviously on earthenware, so that's ordinary low-firing clay, like that, as are the Victorian sherds, also on earthenware. Um, the main difference between them, often you find in the Delftware, 
you get small pieces of red pottery as inclusions which you don't find on the Victorian pieces. Also I think the um, tin glaze Delftware is often slightly pinkish, slightly yellowish which you don't get on the later Victorian pieces. Um, compare that with some of the porcelain and you'll see that the porcelain is much much fired at much higher temperature uh, it's very glassy very clear white compared with the Delftware which was fired at a lower temperature um, looking at the decoration obviously as I mentioned Delftware is painted very quickly when wet so you get a very almost impressionistic brush stroke style there that's very typical um, again very typical hand painted um, the same Chinese porcelain can also be hand painted but the Victorian pieces the later pieces are transfer printed very often uh, much more detailed and very different when you compare between the two they're quite distinctive there you can see the difference very easily between two pieces um, as I said the tin glazed glaze is uh, rather fragile, very easily chipped, so often away from the edge of the piece, very easily damaged. Um, very unlike the porcelain, which chips like glass at the edges, very fine chips. And also the blue and white, the later Victorian pieces, obviously they can be damaged, but normally the glaze will go right up to the edge of the break. There, that's very easily spotted. Also another feature of Delftware, uh, plates and platters, they were fired in the kiln using trivet spacers and these leave a stacking scar on the piece. There's a stacking scar there, that's not damage, that is actually made in the kiln, produced in the kiln from the trivet that spaced the plates and platters apart from one another. So that's quite distinctive, you don't get that on later pieces. Delftware colours, uh, you get oranges, blue of course is very common, you also get purple that's produced by adding manganese to the glaze, purple sponge effects there. So hopefully once you look at three pieces together the Delftware is hopefully becoming more recognisable to the porcelain and the blue and white Victorian wares. Another distinctive feature of tin glaze um, are the little dimples which appear in the glaze. Um, it's quite difficult to see these on the video um, and they're not found on every single shard but quite often, quite frequently seen on tin glaze pieces. Um, uh, here are some close-up photos which show them a bit better. They're very distinctive and not found on later transfer or printed wares for example. Let's look now at how Delftware was actually manufactured. Um, Delftware was produced using two firings. The first is called the biscuit firing, which is just to fire the clay body. And then after decoration, there was a second firing to fire the glaze. And we can find good evidence of the biscuit stage and also some kiln furniture, which are pieces of pottery placed in the kiln to protect items or support items while they're being fired and we can find both those in the Thames if you know where to look. Okay here are some pieces I found in the Thames at Rotherhive where there was a Delft pothouse from 1638 to 1684 and these pieces are some of the waste from that, wasters and kiln furniture which were dumped on the foreshore and you can find them there. Um, first we have biscuit ware. As I said this is the first firing of the Delft ware process. So these are before the glazing takes place and obviously these were discarded at that stage. 
Um, it does show quite well the pinkish clay and the yellowish clay. Um, and sometimes when you find these it's easy to confuse them with Mediterranean pottery, um, but they are actually Delftware wasters. Um, we also have some kiln furniture um, in this yellowish clay. There's a rim there and part of a saga, which is a large ceramic object with holes in it. Um, this is a, a picture of what the whole piece would have looked like. These sagas were used in the kiln to contain objects that were being fired. The holes allowed the heat to circulate around the pots but not allow too much heat in which would cause them to distort or flames which would cause them to get burnt or discoloured. Um, you can see this bit has got fragments of biscuit ware stuck to it and fragments of charcoal um, and this muddy concretion. There's also um, traces of Delftware glaze on the outside of the saga there. Okay, here are some of the best pieces of Delftware which I found on the Thames foreshore. And we'll look through these and it will give us an idea of the different styles of decoration that you find on Delftware and also the different forms of pots that were made from Delftware. And as far as possible, um, to distinguish between English Delftware and Dutch Delftware, which was heavily imported into London. Um, it's quite difficult to tell different Delftware centres apart because they all copied very much the same sort of decoration. Um, especially the Chinese style of decoration, uh, which is um, known as Wan Li decoration. The bird on the rock is a very favourite motif there and these rather sort of freehand circles and lines you see quite a lot on one Lee decorated Delftware. Also these stylized flowers are another thing you see. Um, here's another bit. Um, obviously when you've got a foot rim you know that you're talking about a plate or a platter. The, um, most of the ones which have a hole pierced in the foot rim are Dutch they were uh, for wires to hold the piece up for display. Um, here are a few pictures of complete platters and plates with one Lee decoration uh, from the Southwark pot houses so that you can get an idea of what a complete piece looks like and you can see obviously um, the part of the decoration that is on this piece which I found in the Thames. Floral motifs were very popular. You get uh, what is probably a sunflower or large flower on the base of platters and plates. Uh, there's another one there and another one there. This sort of design is very Dutch in execution there. You also get uh, coloured plants, flowers, uh, tulips, grapes, pomegranates as well and all these especially with the orange petals are from those sort of designs. Um, here's a nice piece with painted polychrome that is many coloured decoration on both sides uh, that would have been a fabulous piece if it had been complete. Um, and here are some pictures also of those sort of pieces of Delftware. Other designs that you're likely to find, uh, there's also white on blue decoration, Bianco Sopra Bianco it's called, which just means um, white on top of white. There, there's a little piece there. Um, sponge decoration, you can see it's just been sponged there, was very commonly used for trees, either side of a royal figure. Um, here's a picture of a complete dish.
other forms of decoration, uh, people. That is part of a Chinese boy. You can just see an ear and a top knot there. Uh, also, architectural motifs that looks like a church or a steeple of some sort. Um, the English chargers and plates very often had a blue dash, a series of blue dashes around the edge. Um, they're known as blue dash chargers, obviously, and imaginatively. Uh, but that distinguishes English ones from other countries' outputs. Here are some pictures of blue dash chargers. Uh, a lot of Delftware was used for medicine pots, uh, sometimes called alberellos, which are just tall containers, cylindrical containers. Uh, like that. That that design has got some luster on it, so I think that's probably a Mediterranean uh, origin for that piece. Um, often the medicine pots had spots going round them, or dashes, or running motifs, a sort of rope motif there, um, and they are straight-sided cylinders. There you can see. Here are some pictures of some complete medicine pots. Other pieces, um, this rather strange looking piece with a spout here and a little sort of a finial uh, is from a flower vase or a flower pot uh, and here's a picture of the complete item. And that is part of the handle of a porringer and here's a picture of a complete piece. And the most complete piece I found in the Thames is this piece of Delftware, sadly not decorated, very plain, but still nice to find one almost complete. Uh, this is probably a salt, in other words you put it on the table to contain salt for a meal, um, possibly also used for mixing uh, medicines or ointments, that sort of thing. A quick word about Delftware tiles, obviously the Dutch factories produced millions upon millions of tiles in the 17th and 18th centuries and beyond of course um, and many of these are found in London but the London pothouses produced tiles as well in a range of subjects um, geometric designs were very popular biblical scenes are often found as well here are a few examples of Delftware tiles that I found on the foreshore. No idea whether these are London tiles or Dutch, probably Dutch. Um, these are just some ge geometric designs there. And here are some pictures of London Delftware tiles that have been found in excavations. Here are some details about some helpful books on Delftware and London Delftware. Um, the first two are short but very informative. You can pick them up for less than a fiver. Um, the first one is English Delftware by Anthony Ray. Um, here are the details on that book. And Shire have published an excellent short book on British Delftware, British Tin Glazed Earthenware by John Black, and here are the details of that book. Um, a bit more expensive at nearly £30 uh, second hand because it was published in the 1980s, um, but still excellent with a lot of relevant information. London Delftware by Frank Britton. And here are the details for that. The best and most recent book on the London pothouses was published by Molas, Museum of London Archaeological Service, in 2008. Um, it's full title, London's Delftware Industry, the Tin Glaze Pottery Industries of Southwark and Lambeth. 
snappy title, but it does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, that's published by Molas, as I said, written by Kieran Tyler, Ian Betts and Roy Stevenson. Um, an excellent book which crams in much detail from the excavations in South London that have been done over the years. Uh, sadly out of print, so not available online for less than £250, but you can borrow a copy from your library to uh, read for about £7. Um, time for a reprint, please Molos on that book. Um, a couple of books about tiles. Uh, the Shire series has a very good short book um, on Delftware tiles generally um, by Hans van Lemmen and um, here's the details on that book. Um, a larger and more expensive book, weighing in at about £40, uh, is Tin Glazed Tiles from London by Ian Betts and Rosemary Weinstein, which is another excellent Molas publication. And here are the details of that book. Tide tables showing the times of low tides on the Thames throughout the year can be found here at the Port of London Authority website. Um, for general good mudlarking advice and for viewing other people's amazing mudlarking finds, I would recommend a visit to the London Mudlark Facebook page. I'm sure there's a link for it somewhere below. Um, if you do find anything historically significant yourself, um, then you do have a responsibility to share that with the wider community. For identification and recording of artefacts, uh, contact your Finds Liaison Officer or FLO at the Museum of London and they will arrange to have your finds recorded, if they're significant, on the Portable Antiquities Scheme website so that everyone can enjoy them and study them. Time for some mudlarking rules and a little bit about mudlarking safety. Eyes only searching is allowed on the foreshore but no digging or scraping is allowed without a Port of London authority permit. Some areas of the foreshore are archaeologically sensitive and scheduled monuments and no digging or even scraping is allowed there whether you have a permit or not. Um, think safety. There are hazards on the foreshore. Mud itself obviously is slippery um, and there are areas of deep mud uh, which should be avoided. There are unstable objects um, and stones so beware of your footing. There are broken bottles and broken glass and other sharps so beware of those. And the rising tide itself can be a hazard, it does come in quite quickly. So always leave yourself an escape route and always carry your phone in case of emergencies. If you are trapped in deep mud um, and heading towards a watery grave as the tide rises, I can recommend nothing better than to download one of my other talks. Um, I hope to do a whole series of talks on ceramic history. Um, and I hope you enjoy them. Thank you.